Hi, everybody. Hi. So it wouldn't be a podcast without the dogs, so I'm sure they will bark the entire time. And if they don't for the first 10 minutes, don't worry, they're coming. Anyway, drove me insane. <laughs> Posted on Instagram my bench. Guess what? They were barking in the back. Like literally, I train with the bows on, so I do not have to listen to this for hours on end every day. Yeah. We are moving houses in October, and I can't wait. Ish, yeah. November, yeah. The only required we, requirement we have at this stage is no not dogs. the only one, but <laughs> one of the requirements is no dogs barking next door. That's it, for let's sure. Be honest, it's high on the list. It's high on the list, and he went even. I, I was pissed in with you. Like there's five of them here. Anyway. Yeah, we were walking in a neighborhood, and we were like, "Oh, this is so nice. It would be such a good location." We hear one dog barking. We just walk the other way straight yeah, to the park. Yeah, well, because suddenly there's four of them losing their shit. They're flexing with that here. They love barking dogs because there's the. That you see that in Brazil, they're flexing a lot with the whole security thing. Like they tell you, like Brazil is unsafe, and there are some very unsafe places in Brazil. But like where we are is actually very safe. Fionopolis is very safe, and we are in a safe place for Fionopolis. And people flex about security just as much. We have a fucking armed guard at the condominium. Who knows why? Yeah. There's right. absolutely no need for the dude. I mean, everything is like that. Yeah. I think it's flexing, let's be honest. Anyway. I don't know what it is, but at this stage... So they flex with barking dogs. Yeah, at this stage we walk with the noise cancelling. I walk with noise cancelling, AirPods, <sighs> Julian with, with the bows, and that's how we Just walk Just to around. train so I don't lose my we, shit. We have like, we have calls like... Yeah, three. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Autistic people. <laughs> like, <laughs> Although I'm pretty sure it would piss anybody else. But Honestly, anyway. this is not autistic. This is not, yeah, I don't, this I think it's like 100% a... 100% annoying to everyone. Yes, I'm sure it is. Anyway, episode 200 and something. Today we are going to talk about uh, somatic errors. Uh, I want because I want to go about uh, prediction versus observation because I can tell from the comments that I'm getting that there's still some confusion about that. It will always be confusing because it is such a uh, amazing concept, but also such a complicated, yeah, such a complex thing. So it will always be confusing, but uh, we can narrow it down, oversimplifying it always to uh, some simple components that I think I need to explain better uh, or make more simple or both basically yeah. in order to make more simple right but uh, let's go at the prediction versus observation again so that you guys understand what I mean so prediction versus observation is a Bayesian inference right so that's literally you make a hypothesis you try to predict the future based on that hypothesis and then if you're right, then you know the hypothesis was correct. This is how science is made, right? Sci they always say science is a mindset. That's what it is, is you have an hypothesis that you're gonna bounce against facts, against observation, not facts, in order to find out if you were right in your hypothesis or not. And if you were right, then you can move forward. It's all percentages based, obviously. So, so do you have like a small, like simple example for that, maybe? Right, so let's say you, uh, you're you trying to measure a football field, right? And you have a ruler, mm -hmm. right? So the ruler is uh, 10 meters long, right? And the uh, football field is 100 meters. So football, not soccer, not football, American football. Anyway, 100 meters long, right? And so you thinking it's going to take 10 of them to get there, right? So you, uh, you start to measure, and at the end, you get 10 of them, and you are almost at the end. So, yeah. and that's how a Bayesian inference works, is yeah. you are correct almost, always, it's a percentage thing. So the Bayesian inference is that, is hypothesis versus what actually happens. It's a game of percentages, not a zero or one. So where you're correct to say 10 times the ruler, more or less, always, because the ruler is not gonna be exactly 10 meters, yeah. the field is not gonna be exactly 100 meters, and even the measuring of one, you might lose a centimeter here or there just by the action of measuring. All right, so that means that you're not gonna get exactly to 10 because welcome. But so you're trying to predict how many rulers you need to measure that full build field. And you're gonna see that you were 10 within a reason reasonable expectation of error. Yeah. That tells you you were right about your idea of the ruler versus the field. But you also, what is your margin of error? Mm -hmm. That can be calculated. Mm -hmm. It's a mathematical process that is called probability mathematics that allows you to know that it's 10 ruler within a certain percentage of chance either mm -hmm. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So all that can be measured, calculated, and you know exactly what your percentages of that you're going to have 10 rulers within a specific, yeah. like which is not the same thing as statistics. Yeah. Right, you have probability, you have statistics. Those are two different. Statistics is not mathematics. It's a science almost on, it, on its own. Yeah. You have probability mathematics, which is not the same thing as statistics. Anyway, so because it gets very complicated. But the idea was I measure more or less 10 rulers to get to the field. So I was right about the field being 100 meters because out of 10, I got 10 of them. It's a little bit that process, right? But you have to understand, so that's how the world works. It's not a zero or a one. It's going to be always ish. There's a probability always either way. That's a code right there. <laughs> yeah, everything, that's what, but that's quantum mechanics. Everything is ish. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so that's a Bayesian inference. You make a hypothesis and you try to uh, get the observation to see if you were right in your hypothesis or not. Right. So and then uh, of measurements come, come into play and all of that. So. The to go prediction versus observation, for example, like that difference that there was when you when you measure the field because it wasn't exactly 100 meters, your ruler wasn't exactly 10 meters. There's going to be a gap between the two, right? That's a somatic error. Uh -huh. okay. Is the gap between what happened between the prediction? I need 10 of them, and the observation was that well, there was 10, and then x, and there are more or less by that much. There was a difference. That difference is a, is the somatic error. Why does it, matter, does it matter somatic error? What does that matter? Because for the next time I'm trying to guess the length of a field, I have to remember that there was, on that time, there was a difference and why were there a difference. So, and that's going to be the crux to the whole system is why is there a difference? Because you measure the 10 rulers and they don't get exactly to 100 meters, so why? Then you start to understand, okay, there's a ruler problem, there's a field problem, there's a measuring problem. Right. So now you start to make a probability based on, can I trust who made the ruler? Can I trust who made the field? Can I tr trust who makes the measuring? Mm -hmm. That has to come into play for you to be able to make a better judgment of the distance for the next time. Yeah, exactly. So now I'm going to have to go find out who the ruler, who makes the ruler, if it's precise or not. Yeah. Then who measured, the, who made the field and who made the measurement. Out of those three, I'm going to figure out who fucked up, or did all three fucked up, or one, most likely one fucked up more than, than the other two, or two out of three. I need to figure this out to be able to reduce the mistake that I made calculating the length of the field. And that's the whole process. That's a Bayesian inference. So you're trying to, but what matters is the somatic error, is the difference between the prediction this is 10 rulers versus the observation, 10 rulers and a difference. Yeah. The key is the difference. So you cannot change the prediction, as in like you can't really Well, on the next time, the next I know time. it's not exactly 10. Yeah. So when we say prediction, imagine a hypothesis. Prediction of the future, but everybody thinks like, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow. No, that's not that type of a prediction. It's more like a hypothesis that you make on, is this hot when I touch it? Right, because it's yeah. <laughs> it is hot. Exactly. Right. So hot, hot. Well, it depends on Instagram. Right. Depends on the angle, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I've been doing cardio yeah, yesterday. Exactly. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Depending on the month, you know, water retention and shit. Exactly. Right. right, but that's, there you go. Right, so there's a problem about how hot. It's not your, this is, this is subjective, so define hot. So now, you know what I mean? And every single time, and then, yeah, Instagram versus holding water. So all of that is a basic inference. So that's how science is made. The idea is you make a hypothesis, a, uh, a prediction of what you're going to find, and then you see if it fits observation. That tells you you're in the right direction. That, not that you were right, because there is no facts in that sense, but that you're going in the right direction because you were mostly correct. So the size of the somatic error of the gap in measurement will tell you exactly where you were, if you were successful or not at measuring the field. Now. Does it matter if you're successful or not at measuring the field? Well, it turns out that's the principle of what life is. The point of life is to learn to measure the field correctly. That's what Schrodinger talked about in the book, What is Life? And that's what the free energy principle actually codified in mathematics. Is that system? That's because in order to survive, in order to not, and that, that goes all the way to quantum mechanics with entropy and all of that, 
life is based on understanding that, how to measure the field correctly. You can see that even from a survival mechanism. Yeah, I was thinking about that right now. Like, yeah, yeah right? is that, is if I want to survive, I need to be able to predict what's coming better, and not just one time, better and better and better. So it used to be that the bear is coming, I can smell it, right? All right, so I can, then I can smell it. So that's better than waiting until he bites me off. Mm -hmm. But at some point it becomes But like smelly man is still close. Right, oh yeah. Right. So right. then the next one is, can I hear it? Okay, hearing it means I got some more distance. But eventually you work your way all the way to that bush is moving over there. Now, you don't know if the bear is coming or not because it's not accessible to your senses anymore. Because you cannot smell it or hear it. But there is a sign that might indicate that the bear is coming. So now, I can hear, I can hear the, the, I can't hear him panting, <laughs> but I can hear the branches breaking. Depending how big the branches is that is breaking, I can start to guess the weight of the thing breaking the branch. If the weight is high enough, the branch breaking makes enough sound, then the thing is big. I can calculate how many predators there are around me and how many of, of them fit that type of a size. And then I can raise the likelihood of it being a bear. And out of that, I'm going to realize if I need to run or not. Mm -hmm. So the problem is if I run too soon, I don't gather the stuff that I need to do. I don't stay hunting, so I don't eat. So I, might, I might die of starvation. But if I stay too long, I'm dead. Yeah. So which one? And that's the process of Bayesian inference. Now, what is fascinating with that, and that's too long of a podcast if I go into it, is that it seems everything in uh, the universe even non-living things work out of a Bayesian inference. It seems even uh, the cosmos is a Bayesian inference model. Like there is an evolution of the cosmos that, uh, that, that fits the Bayesian inference model. I mean, it goes, anyway, it seems to be the basis of this universe. Long story when I say that, but anyway, yeah, so it, it goes that far. So the system of uh, prediction observation, people ask me like, how do I change the prediction and stuff like that, right? So, you're not going to change the prediction at the prediction versus observation level. You, you, that's not how this works. That's not what interests us. What interests us is the somatic error and how we deal with it, because that's where everything starts. So why? Because when I say prediction versus observation, you think you're making the prediction. You're making a prediction way, way down the road based on all the predictions you made prior. The problem is that the prediction made prior, most of them are not conscious. Right, so you have to understand that, and that's the whole point of the free energy principle, is life um, is like a super uh, quantum computer that has its own Bayesian inference model, right? That actually was measured, that's the free energy principle, that interacts as to uh, not negate entropy, but trying to produce less entropy, right? It's fighting entropy. That means that the unicellular in, uh, organism, like a cell, uh, interact with the world in a Bayesian inference model type of thing. Right? That means that uh, a, member, a cell is capable of calculations that the best computers that we have cannot. It deals with the world as, as a Bayesian inference model that can be measured, that can be calculated. And that's the free energy principle. There's a mathematical formula for that on how a cell deals with its exterior. And it's like so it seems that the Bayesian inference is the model of everything in this universe. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what matters. So that's why like prediction versus observation, in a way, it doesn't matter uh, when I say that because most of it is done at a non-conscious level. It only becomes conscious when it's already failing all the, all the stuff in the back. Yeah. So that's what we, I explained about the hierarchies of the nervous system. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. So the first four are completely, you have to understand, the first one is the heart. Yeah. A fast does it beat, uh, the, the, the time in between beats, that's the HRV, right? Uh, that alone is the first hierarchy, that obey a Bayesian inference model. Your heart is predicting how much it needs to beat, and like the HRV and everything, and it's not, it does that, so, so people are gonna think it's a heart that commenced the heart to do it. It's the brain that commenced the heart to do it. Actually, no, the heart does it as its own level, because it reacts to everything else without necessarily going through the brain. The stomach has its own brain. It does things without having to go through. Uh, there's neurons in the heart, there's neurons in the enteric system. So a lot of this is happening without having to go through the brain, without having to go like a, 
where is the brain when a, when a cell does that? There is no, there is a, there is a center of the cell, but it's not a brain per se. And yet the processes is already happening there. So, like we're going into very complicated stuff, and you don't need to know any of this really. What you need to understand that it's not about the prediction versus observation. It's about the gap. You don't need to know what a ruler is of 10 meters, how it was built, what is it made of. You just need to know it's 10 meters, and then you need to know the length of the field that you're playing on. You don't need to know who owns the field. You don't need to know who created the field, who planted the grass. Who, you don't need to know any of that. You just need to know that there is a difference between the 100 meters that you're supposed to get and the 100 meters of that field, yeah. right? And well, the, the, the difference between the two and the somatic error, and that's what interests us, is the somatic error and how do I deal with it? Yeah. Well, that's also like, I understand that you're saying like people don't need to know the whole process of it, but at the same time, you have to understand how complex it is. You know what I mean? Right, so let me explain to you what it the, is. okay, so, so I, 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 again, we're gonna talk about the somatic error, that, that's what matters, but to go back to your point of what it is, so to, to, for you to understand how complex the system is. It means that the, the Bayesian inference model is how the universe works. So that means that technically what we are doing, we are not creating a, hey, it's going to rain tomorrow, is we are cre creating different universes that we can, and we're going to choose one of them to live in, trying to match it with the universe that is around us. So you know that the multiverse in Marvel, right? No. She's almost perfect. Anyway, <laughs> so you guys know what the multiverse <laughs> is, right? That's what human beings are. Human beings create their own multiverse and they choose to live in the universe of their liking. Mm -hmm. The point is that the universe of your liking matches the universe that you're in closer so that you don't die from not predicting that the bear is coming. But you are creating a multiverse and out of that, you're gonna live in one versus the other, always changing and trying to match it to the universe you actually live in. So, but you don't live in a universe. You live in a representation of an universe you want to live in, that you think is the best version of the universe out there. So it's almost like a bridge to the universe that there is. You live on that bridge. Yeah, so you create, if I say that correctly, you create your own world that matches as much of the real world. Exactly. But, so perception is reality, really. So we don't live in reality. We live in our best approximation of it. And you need to understand that. So reality, the way we talk about it, is an illusion. We don't live in it. We live in our best approximation of it. And that's why you can have illusions. That's why when you're down, the world changes around you. Because literally, as your perception of the world changes, you live in a different world. So then everything is affected by it. smell, taste, ev uh, processing power. Everything that you do has changed because you're living in a different universe than you were prior, literally, because that's where you live in. You don't actually live in reality. You live in your best approximation of it. Because what you're doing is you're always trying to figure out why. Why is the ruler did not do 10 by 10? Because mm. you need to understand the why. So the point of the whole system is the why. There's a somatic error always, and the system is designed to understand the why there was a somatic error. That's all you need to know, is the somatic error. There is a gap between the universe you live in and the universe we live in. The, the goal of, this, of life is to figure out the why there's a gap. Because then you can move forward. And that's the point of life, moving forward. Always learning, always getting better. So let's talk about the somatic error. So now you have a somatic error. There was that mistakes of the ruler versus the field, right? All right, so how do we deal with it? Well, there's three ways of dealing with that somatic errors. You're going to use all three, but you're going to lead to well, one percentage or you know, one versus the other, right? So it's like you have three bags, and you're going to put your explanation as to why there was a somatic error in one of the three bags. One of the bags is, I'm going to change the world, yeah. right? So if we look at it of, uh, there'd be, the f in a way, the field versus the, let's say the field was not 100 meters, was, was 95 meters, right? So you have different ways of looking at this. You could change the field uh, length, which means you get your 10 rulers and then you get a 10 and then you erase the line of the field and you create a new one. Yeah. That fixed the problem. So what you did is you change the world to fit 
the, the earlier prediction that you yeah. needed 10 rollers to do that. Yeah. Right. Or you could change the prediction, which is you could change the ruler to make it 10, we get exactly at the end of the field, right? And the third way would be, uh, yeah, well, there's a gap, good enough. Like you change the way you feel about it. Uh -huh. Right, those are the three ways. So you're basically ignoring it a bit. Uh, or Not changing the, the level of importance you need to put it. So the bush is moving over there, right? At first, I get really scared. Now he has, he has, uh, moved 52 times in a row and he was a large elk but not as dangerous as a bear right after a while you see the bush moving you can still choose to get scared thinking a bear is coming or you could go yeah it's not as important as i thought it was that a large animal is coming toward me mm. you better be right i was going to say what well, what if the bear then comes at some point then you're dead you're dead that's the problem it's not a very effective way to deal with the world it is a way to deal with the world, it's just not an effective one. Right. It's a risky one. It's always better. So if you see... It's an easy one, though. It's an easier one. Easier one. It's one. not simpler, but it's easier. Uh, the, the way the world works is based on action. You need to breathe, you need to... When you look, you need to move your eyes. Everything is based on action first. So really, the key is change the world. Uh, change the prediction and everything. Change how you feel about things. So, for example, let me explain to you what changing how you feel about it is. Right, so I'm going to use psychoanalysis as an example, Freud. Right, so one of the main things about psychoanalysis was to make you talk about a situation so that you can better grasp what happened. And what he was trying to give you is the, the symbolism of each dream, of each action, of you <coughs> doing this all the time because you want to suck someone's dick. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, that was part mm, of what? Freud. Yeah, usually your father's dick. Uh, in Freud, yeah, yeah, there was stuff like, uh, he said that about a girl, yeah. Oh it was, my yeah. God. But uh, by the way, but just through that kind of stuff, he got a woman out of a wheelchair. She started walking, I kid you not. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. She was just, uh, he was a psychosis that he managed, took a while, but he managed to get past. Yeah, he was crazy, but not that crazy, right? So. And this is very interesting is we lost really this, the, the art of psychoscience, art of psychoanalysis, we lost it. But if you look at what Freud was trying to do by exposing symbolism of certain actions and dreams and things like that was, he was allowing you to understand the actions taking place better and to have an action on it. Not through action of physically doing something. What he was trying to get you to do is to change the prediction. Really, understand the symbolism of your dream so that you can have, you can change the universe you're into, the next one, through the prediction system. Mm -hmm. Right. The problem is now we are in a world that does not, um, does not say that the, uh, working on yourself is uh, effective. What they're saying is being a victim is effective. So now you talk about your problem to state that you were that you had trauma or what like that. You know what happens when you do that? You can change the way you feel about things. This was bad, yeah, but I'm a victim, so it's not my fault, so I feel better about it and things like that. So instead of going from me changing the prediction, you're going toward changing how you feel about it. So now psycho psychoanalysis is just talking about your trauma so that by, ju by talking enough about a trauma, you justify the fact that it's not you. So you change the way you felt about things. So you have not changed your accent, your actions have not changed the way the things affect you have not changed, but you change the way you don't feel bad about it anymore. I get it. Yeah. But you have not taken ownership of it. So you went to a passive form, which is changing how you feel about it in a way. Yeah. Right. So I found that very interesting because if we look at the fitness world today, right, look at what they, they're all doing. So first it was, you have to train hard. If you look at uh, Dorian Yates, Alain Schwarzenegger, all those guys, they were like, look, you have to murder yourself in the gym. You want to make progress? All right. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, that was a very cool story. Um, Schwarzenegger got to the gym and he was an upper body guy. He had no legs. I don't know how that feels, but I'm sure it's painful. Um, he had no legs, no calves. So he used to walk around with those big baggy pants. Now you know my secret. <laughs> and uh, a tank top. 
is that a secret? Well, yeah, it is a secret. That's why, like, that's why I keep putting the pants when I squat on the video, because if yeah. I don't have the pants, the, the neoprene makes my leg look even it's skinnier. It's very funny. It's not funny. <laughs> I look like a funny. fucking twig. You look like a frog. <laughs> that's racist. Is that because I'm French? I'm well, I didn't offended. Even think about that. That is so but racist. But in that case, yes, it's definitely because you're it's so racist. She's just gonna be froggy. Wow. <laughs> I didn't wow. Even, I didn't even realize that. But yes, so racist. Definitely. Anyway, I stand behind that. Right. Sentence. So he would go into the gym with his baggy pants and his tank top because it was all upper body and everything. And at some point he was like, "All right, this has to stop." So he went the other way. He had skinny caps, so he wore shorts and put a huge sweater on. So he would hide his upper body and show his calf to everybody, and everybody made fun of him. Oh. Right, so guess what happened? He developed some of the biggest calves there was at the time. Still didn't have legs, but he had huge calves. You know why? Because he worked his ass off. You know why? Because they were making fun of him. Oh. Right, but you see what he did? Yeah. He created the chance to action by changing the sweater and everything, knowing it was going to drive him forward and everything. So that's how you deal uh, with it on a conscious level. It is one of the form of dealing with a somatic error. He was not getting the success he wanted. So in that case, he changed the prediction, but he took action into the world to get to the result. So that's um, the gym culture back then. You know what the gym culture is now? Nutrition, drugs. You know what they both have in common? They don't require you to do shit. You know what they both have in common? They make you feel different. Not through action. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right? So, and then you see, so that's for uh, bodybuilding, but you see in the CrossFit stuff. Now, they all have those physio stuff. Like, there was Julius Maddox, the guy who wants to bench 360 kilo, 800 pounds raw, like, which is absurd, right? He's so past everybody else, it's crazy. And he's doing uh, an Instagram stuff with one of the physio guys, the same who used the the oblique opener, do you want to give credit? I'm not going to, tell, I'm not going to say his name. But because he's getting paid, he goes onto those pages because he's getting paid. Good for him. He deserves to get paid. He has a family and he's a monster bencher. He needs to get paid. But the guy is making him do stuff like drive your lads and then he's putting bends on him and say like, uh, I'm going to tell him to bring his shoulder down and everything. And I'm like, you're not going to tell him shit because you bench 60 kilos and he bench 360 kilos. He's a master bencher is benching every week for the last, what, 25 years, whatever the fuck it is, 30 years. He knows how to bench. You're not going to say shit to him. Like the idea that, oh, use the bend and engage your lats. So that's well, that's, and that's, we see that a lot with CrossFit, with those physio exercises, like engage your lats, engage the glute. How about you train them? To engage the lats, you need to have lats. Right, are you training hard enough to develop lats? You know how you develop muscle? You train hard. Stop with the food, drugs, yeah. uh, technique stuff. Those are, at the end, those are just excuses because you're not doing the work. You're not doing the work in the gym. You saw that a lot in track as well, where they were telling you like, oh, you need to put your feet there. If you're going to put your foot exactly there or have this angle, you're going to have this and this and right. much better time where you're going to yeah. gain a, a hundredth of a second on this and this, and then we can improve you like this to this mm -hmm. amount of time. In the end, it's about running fast. Of course, in technique is required, but at the end, you have to be fast. But it doesn't work. You know what he does, those it things? It doesn't, it doesn't. It no, really you know, you know oh, he works on one thing. He gets clubs to buy the expensive equipment to measure that stuff that actually doesn't make you run faster. You know why um, Usain Bolt runs so fast? Because he worked his ass off from mm -hmm. an early age, because he was so gifted and he's fast. Yeah. That's it. It's fast. He didn't need the, the fancy measurement and stuff like that. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but you have to understand. This is about talent first and work on top of it. You can't live one without the other, by the way. You can have talent and no work. You can have work and no talent. You're not going to make it. You need talent and work. Yeah. And the fancy equipment, the stuff like that, bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Bullshit. I don't know that they have it in Jamaica. They're OK there. Okay, I, fucking dominating the world. By the way, Chinese Olympic weightlifting, they're pretty good too, right? You don't see any of this shit. They don't decompose it with computers, stuff like that. It's work, but you know what that? They train three times a day. So do you think that's an example of 
changing how they feel about it and the technique and stuff yeah. like that? Of or changing. at least cultures or stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yes, after that, we're getting into the complexities yeah. of humans. So it gets, after that, it gets uh, even more complex as we go. But the system at the, at the beginning is always based on the three ways to deal with the somatic error. In a, in a, uh, in that pl in that sense, to me, what what I see me is just it's consumerism, entering fitness. That's all. To me, it's only one thing: is how do we make more money? That's yeah. all. It has nothing to do with results. I see that more and more, and social media has, has its part into this. Is the system is not designed to do anything but generate money? Yeah. It doesn't care. It's not going to make you like to get that fucking thing with the bun and against down on the bench press. At the end, you're going to have to bench. Like if you actually ask Julius Maddox, he was asked many times, how do I get my bench higher? And he said, 16 weeks, start out of weight, put 10 pounds on the bar every week for 16 weeks. Yep. Work your way down, 10 pounds every week, that's it. Max reps for 16 weeks. Bench will go up. Now, how much, how much money can you make saying that? You know how much money you can do with the band and the thing, and then there's an industry behind that is going to sell the bands, and then the tac 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 tac. You know what I mean? Well, and what it was from a sprint perspective is like when you don't perform or you don't get that time on that race, you can always say, yeah, but you didn't do the technique mm -hmm. like this, and it was because there was this thing happened and you got distracted, so you didn't put the mm -hmm. technique, and that's why you don't have the time. And by well, the way, it's not it it's not to say that just doing the 16 week bench will work every time, but it has to start with that. Start and after that. that, we go like, all right, your triceps are failing; they're not progressing as fast right. as the rest. Now we start to look at triceps. Then we look at lats. Instead of engaging them, you need to develop them. So we're going to do barbell rows and pull-ups. Yeah. Right? That's not enough. Let's add some dumbbell rows. That's not enough. Let's add this, and then you develop the lats and everything. And then at the end, we can go like, oh, that extra two kilo or five kilo is because you're not engaging your lats quite hard. Exactly. Okay, then let's look at that exercise that's right. going to teach you to engage your lats better. But so that exercise in itself is good. Yeah, at the end of the line though, there's so much shit that has to be done before we do that exercise. But they're not going to say that because that's not where the money is. Because at the end, the result comes from you training hard. Mm -hmm. That's it. But you can't sell that. And so, and that's my problem, because that's what we see with the medical world more and more. We see, a, uh, we see the, the, the big pharma uh, having 96% of studies on uh, either uh, drugs. 96% of the medical world money-wise is either drugs or devices. It's, that's it. 86%, I think it was, of all studies are paid for by the big pharma industry that owns the data and does not share all of it. So that's not science, by the way, either. It goes on and on and on like that. So what we see now is we see an industry, for example, in the US and healthcare that is trying to keep people not dying because that's bad for business, but sick as long as they can. This is not a healthcare system. This is a sick care system. They want people sick and keep them there. Two years of the pandemic, we never approached the fact that obesity was a problem. Right, this is where we are. So the problem is with that, and I'll make a podcast explaining where that started uh, from with the medi uh, medical world when the big pharma started to control that idea that all medicine had to be done by uh, evidence-based. That's where they got their foot in really the most is because at that moment, they controlled the field because they control the data. Since they do the studies, they control what is released, then they control, and everything is evidence-based, then they control the field. That was very sneaky. That was very sneaky. So people think they're looking at science, but they're not, because I don't have to lie. I can just tell you all the positives, but not the negatives. Or I can tell you 20 cases got better out of 10,000, which is not statistically significant, but it doesn't matter. So that's how they control the field. So the problem with that is this is what we see going with the fitness industry more and more, with like science-based. No, not science-based. When you mean science-based by that, it's like trusted source of information. That's all. It's trust me more than the other in what I say. Anyway, I'm ranting, but that's another part. So let's go back to somatic error. So you have three ways of dealing with a somatic error. So my idea, my idea on aut uh, autism was that, is that autistic people have, uh, out of the three bags, the bag of that is toward action that is by far the largest, that is, uh, in the case of symptoms, too big for the other two, which means that autistic people have a huge bag when it comes to taking actions. 
And that would make sense when you look at the imprinted brain theory, where they were saying autism is the paternal side of genes expressed through epigenetics. So paternal means that masculine energy that is more toward things and actions. Mm -hmm. right? Maternal would be more like people and dealing with things, which is exactly what autistic people are not capable of doing. So you can see how that relates, right? But so we would go toward more on action side of things. So, the, but that would mean that the back, the bag of the prediction and the, how I feel about it would be very small. So, and this is the very important part that everybody is missing is most people have a fairly equal size of bags, right? Autistic people do not. They have a huge size for action, but small for the other one. So. We are trying to fix autism, even though you cannot fix autism because it's not a disease, right? But they're trying to make those people better by fixing the prediction side. The problem is that side is very small, very weak, not talented, and you can't get anything done out of that. What you want is you want to get everything done out of action yeah. because that is where the autistic person lives. You're trying to influence the outcome through the prediction, which is exactly where they are weak at. And that's why I think the fail comes from, is we're trying to go at it from a prediction perspective, yeah. whereas this is what uh, autistic people suck at. So you don't want to focus your effort there because they can't follow you. Yeah. They're literally, developmentally, slower than you there. Yeah. They are very much faster on the action side, which is, you see autistic people do the same thing for 10 hours straight. They are uh, capable of understanding pattern and forming uh, you know, like uh, concentration on a single target to a degree that other people cannot. Yeah. But if you take them on the prediction level, they're very weak. They're just not good at it. So yeah. this is not where the war needs to be fought. Yeah. The, with autistic people, the war needs to be fought on the action side, not on the prediction side. Yeah. And if you look at another uh, major weakness of people on the spectrum, is that changing how you feel about it. We can't. Yeah. We get very overwhelmed with certain things, <gasps> we freak out, we don't understand it, and then we can't change it. Yeah, we I, cannot change how we yeah, feel about things. That's exactly, if I feel a certain way about something, it will never change. It will never change. And so what's interesting never. is that women on the spectrum get fixated on things. Oh, yeah. Right, so look at it. So let's imagine this for a second. Let's play that thought experiment game. That how I change about something cannot, how I change how I feel about something is not working. Mm -hmm. That bag is closed. You get, you feel a certain way and you're stuck because you can't change how you feel about it, right? You're stuck. But, and then most people will try to go at the prediction, how come I feel like that? Whereas for an autistic person, I think it's more, let's take an action about it. Yeah. And if I cannot take an action about it, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I think the key with autism is uh, not looking at the prediction is, can I change the world to fit how I feel? If I cannot, then you need to ignore it. Yeah. You need to put it aside. You need to understand that this is not the world made for you. And especially in the case of women, you fixate about something. I'm not asking you to resolve the issue. I'm asking you to put it aside and take an action. And if you cannot take an action, then forget it's there. Yeah, that's, it, it's, for me, that, that's been, yeah. Right, the problem is for NTs, uh, you know, neural, uh, so, normies. <laughs> um, People who don't, who are, who, who who won't understand. This will be seen as quitting. This will be seen as repressing. Mm -hmm. No, this is not, re for autistic people, that is not repressing. That is pushing aside, which is not the same. In your case, you, you would repress, you would just swallow up your pride and everything, but it would still uh, go around in the prediction side. It would still turn around, trying the prediction, trying to figure out exactly what happened. Yeah. In our cases, it won't happen like that. It will, we will just completely put it aside, but without affecting the prediction level because that prediction is so weak. And then instead, we'll just try to take action about it. Yeah. Yeah, the key for us is action. That, that's for me, like, that's been, that's been a great, amazing. Like, why, why it hit me so hard, it was because my, as a kid, my mom got really sick and she was always mm -hmm. sick. I cannot change how I feel about that. Yeah. I will never change about how I feel about it. I cannot take an action towards it because, thank God, she didn't pass away, right? So, so we explained, she, uh, um, when, she, when you were seven, she was yeah. diagnosed with bone cancer and yeah. she had six months to live. Yeah, exactly. That was 15 years ago and she's still going. Yeah, she's extremely strong. I cannot 
feel different about that. I still feel exactly the same about uh, it. The same, yeah. This is the same thing with my brother. Like, I feel his death today like it, like it happened yesterday. And it will never change. It will never change. And in a way, like, for me, like, they, they always told me, like, talk about it, talk about it. And I'm like, it doesn't help. It doesn't change anything. It does, because it it, we cannot me, change a prediction based on that. Thing, yeah. it makes me only feel bad. Yeah. Because I I, it creates me, the feeling. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. the only thing that helps is, like, looking at, at it like, oh, I have a mom that showed me what a strong person is or that mm -hmm. actually loved me or stuff like that, that helped me. But I cannot change how yeah. I feel Express the feelings, doesn't Never. Do, do not change them. Like they always told me like, oh, talk or talk or talk with someone. And they tried to put me in like... Uh, mm. the therapy. Therapy. Yep. therapy. I was in therapy and I looked at the woman like this. Right, so, hours hours but it depends how the therapy is done because the therapy can be done so that you can change how you feel about it, yeah. which is acceptance, which yeah. we cannot have. Exactly. Or yes. it can be changing the toward the, the prediction, which has to be done at a very low level because we're not good at it, where it's like, well, there's a uh, look at what you have instead of what you have not in that case. Yeah. Understand that the world is mean, an existentialist perspective of the world. So philosophy would help you more, an existentialist philosophy, a niche would help you more than someone who you're going to express your feeling toward because it won't change how you feel because we don't have that capacity. Exactly. That's why we get overwhelmed by certain things. Yeah. and stuck within it it's because we fixate and especially on the women's side they, they fixate very 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 strong on stuff god knows i fixate on stuff too because yeah. you cannot change how you feel so the intensity of certain feelings are as strong 10 years after than they are yeah. that moment that's so you hear that a lot about people on the spectrum that they they don't understand their own emotion that's not true what they don't understand is the intensity of the emotion because it seems that it never goes away yeah. We have no control over, like it's, imagine an emotion that you had about something that is always the same even 10 years later. The second you think about it, it comes yeah. the same way. So then everything is traumatic. Yeah. Like you lose, your, you lose um, someone close to you, right? 20 years from now, you might still have the same feeling every time you think about it. Why? Imagine that about an apple. Right. Like everything is traumatic at this stage because everything goes like this. So. Yeah. Um, the only way out is taking an action, is changing the world to make sense of the emotion. Yeah. Yeah. But this is not what this world is telling us to do. What this world is telling us to do is to go at it from a prediction perspective, from a mental, like, change it or accept it or stuff like that. It's like, that is not how it works. We are physical beings, not, we don't think like you. Yeah. It, it doesn't work like that with people on the spectrum. But so you could see how looking at the somatic error would give you an idea of what autism is, which is dealing with somatic error through changing the world, and how we can deal with it. Yeah. It would tell you what a schizoid behavior is. It's dealing with the somatic error by changing prediction system. Yeah. The ruler, not the field. Yeah. So uh, people that are uh, schizoid don't want to do anything about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's like, the most fascinating yeah. thing. It's a demonic possession, it's yeah. all that stuff, yeah. if you look. Well, that's the thing for me when I realize that there is no action to be taken and that I only can be grateful for what I do have and like mm -hmm. developing that prediction side of that I can. That changed everything for me. But you still feel the same way about it. Oh, if I if I, something happens that triggers it, I can cry like I'm seven. Like people like mm -hmm. think I'm in the most horrible stage of my life. No, I'm just feeling exactly like I felt yeah, then. Exactly. And it looks like I'm, my life is so coming to an end. So you can be at peace with it, but it doesn't change the way you feel about it. Exactly. And that's I'm, the life of an autistic person. Yeah. I'm totally at peace with it. And I'm very grateful. Honestly, mm -hmm. I'm very oh, grateful. You but she still feels the same way about exactly. it and will cry because we're getting close to that time of the year where she was diagnosed yeah. the first time. So she will be for two, three days crying every day about it, even though she's grateful for it. You cannot change the way you feel about it. Because yeah. we, we don't have this. That is a skill we do not have. That bag is that big. Yeah. It gets overwhelmed very fast. So any strong emotion is being repeated continuously. And it, and it, it I feel like I'm emotionally eight all the time. Yeah, Because everything is an explosion of, you know, of stuff and everything. And you get like, you have no control over it. It's that. So it's not that we don't understand emotion. It's we don't understand the intensity of it because we're not capable of fixing somatic errors through changing how we feel about it. Yeah. And for me, like, um, to be at peace with it and actually not being so in it is very is, is helping but and when people would tell me like no you have to face your trauma you have to talk about it that only put me like as a someone on the spectrum in like a more 
Right, you because no, but they're right that you have to it. face it, but yeah. they were wrong in how to face it. Yeah, exactly. Because psych, uh, psych, psychologists or psychiatrists will go at it from a prediction perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. which if you look the pills and everything will make you change the way you feel about it. Yeah, but, I, uh, but you cannot, you do not take action. Yeah. That's the problem, especially with the pills, is then they remove the action, yeah. which is the worst thing you can do from an autistic person. Yeah. So this is killing us. Like the pills it is. Is, is murder for an autistic person because you're literally destroying who they are. Yeah. Their way of dealing with a somatic error, which is the only way life moves forward. So there is a, a misunderstanding that it, uh, of the, what the, the spectrum is that is creating massive issues. Yeah. It's if you look at it from an observation perspective, then it's fine. Just understand that we need to take action into a, a world that is constantly loud. Right, everything is the, you know, like sometimes overwhelming, like we have very good sense of observation, so everything is very, very loud, which is great when you're a craftsman doing something you love. It's harder to deal with when you do something you don't like, which is why autistic people hate to do stuff they don't like. The problem is when there is that something. Hatred is so deep. Yeah, like that hatred, because the feeling is so deep because we can't change the way we feel about things. When a feeling is there, it cannot be changed. I know it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't have to, that's just the way it is. We cannot change the way we feel about things. When you know, like you have a, you, you get a hungo, you have a, such a hangover, you can't even smell tequila. Otherwise it makes you puke, right? That's how we feel about things. Yeah. It's, and that's actually the best way to explain it is that, is the smell of that alcohol will make you sick. There's nothing you can do about it mentally because it's a smell, it's the physical aspect that makes you feel so strongly about it. Well, that is how we feel all the time. Mm. The, the, the smell, the stuff will trigger something and there's nothing you can do about it to change it except taking action. Walk away from the tequila bar. I was going to say, so what, what is that? If you're going to fix a semantic error from taking an action, 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 what, action. What would it be for that football field? Right, so we're going to get, we're going to take the measurement and we're going to erase the field, right? And we're going to draw a new line that is exactly 10 times the ruler. I fixed all the problems. Well, at the end, I changed the football field. Who cares? Yeah. Right? So the next time, the question after that was that, OK, so if we were, the, the question would be like, did I fuck up on the ruler or did I fuck up on the football field? Right, so I'm going to have to check the ruler and go back at it. And then, if, and then what I would do is I would fire, the, if I found out that the ruler was correct but the field wasn't, then I fire the guy who drew the line. Yeah. And I'll do it myself. And this time I'll measure correctly the 10, the 10 rulers and then I'll do the football field correctly instead of letting some incompetent bastard do it uh, yeah. poorly. Who doesn't take his job seriously. Like, like all good autistic people do. <laughs> <laughs> we take our job very seriously, right? Exactly. That, and then if there is a measuring error on how I put a one ruler next to the other for the next one, then I'll be more precise and more precise, and then maybe I can create a system to make, and then that's how you move forward. Yeah. And, and every time- you will time, be a master at making- Football fields. Football fields. And then they'll hire you, and you'll make a lot of money doing that. You should be exactly precise. Because you'll be more precise than the other guy, because you will lose your shit if you're not. Because every time you look at it, you go like, that's not right. What did I do? So then maybe you can invent a system that allows you to put one ruler next to the, uh, to the next in a more precise way. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe you can create a better ruler, but that's not really what you do. So what you do is you use the ruler. You don't yeah. create it. I can't create things. I just use them. So that's my issue is I can't change the ruler. Yeah. The ruler is what it is. I have a very, very hard time changing that. What I can do is changing the field or changing the way I apply the ruler. I can do those two things. Yeah. Changing the ruler is very hard for me. So, um, one of the reasons why I love the, the Airdyne 10 minutes Q minus mm -hmm. one is because every time there's something that overwhelms me, I can walk downstairs and do the Airdyne. It does, it's about the Airdyne too and giving a sick. It's more that I walk so downstairs exposure therapy. and going to take an action towards how I feel at this right. point. Right, so it's exposure therapy. There's just different ways of exposure, right, which is dealing with a somatic error. That's what exposure therapy is, right? It's dealing with a somatic error. Or exposure has to be physical. So you feel a certain way, you're going to bring your body to feel as miserable physically as you do mentally. The best way to do it is an airdyne because it hurts. Yeah. So you're on the airdyne, you're suffering. So you're suffering physically just like you're suffering mentally for whatever reason. Then there's no somatic error, you feel like shit. And then from there you can work your way out. Yeah. 
That's for me the biggest mm -hmm. thing. And that's for the Q minus one we created, and it works. And it is, and it's even when we're somewhere, like even like grabbing my phone to read my book, like just mm -hmm. is taking an action towards not feeling like this, or like yeah. I, I. Well, let, let's do a podcast where we go into the more practical stuff on yeah. how to deal with that. We'll explain how you deal with it. So because oh, yeah, women sorry, I just on the to spectrum, no, no, but it's a good idea. Like, like uh, having some like things. That but it's a good idea. Let's do that on the next one because we're already like almost we had fifty minutes. So let's do that on the next podcast. That's a good idea, right? That'll be the next one, is how we deal, uh, practically speaking, how we deal with stuff. Yeah. Yeah, from the spectrum life. Bye. Bye, everybody.